Time now for Morning Rounds, our look at the medical news of the week, and we begin with what's being called a scientific breakthrough. A study published this week in the journal Nature demonstrated the ability to fix a disease-causing gene in actual human embryos. This was accomplished using sophisticated gene editing technology. Here with more on this big development is CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Tara Narula. John, how do you edit a gene? Dana, uh, here's how they do it. The <laughs> DNA in this chromosome had a gene that causes a severe heart problem. So researchers used a special technique called CRISPR to find and help remove the gene inside a human fertilized egg. It's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, really hard to do. The cell then repaired itself, and at the end of the process, the gene that caused the heart defect was gone. It's amazing. Tara, you're a cardiologist. What, <laughs> how do you react to something like this? It's pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, they, they were pretty successful for this type of work in the sense that 72% of the embryos did not have the genetic mutation for this cardiac disorder, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they also didn't have any new mutations in that, those 72%, which is also excellent news. This disease that we're talking about is a disorder that affects about one in 500 individuals, so fairly common. And essentially what happens is the heart muscle does not form properly. Mm -hmm. So it's disorganized, there's fibrosis, and there's no real treatment for it other than symptomatic treatment. And over time, people can develop chest pain, heart failure, arrhythmias, including sudden cardiac death. So for example, when you hear about young athletes who die suddenly on the football field or in a game, many times it's from this disorder. So this would be excellent news. I feel like that. whenever we see something like this and a, a change in technology, people have to get on board with it. They're ethical questions. So yeah. to both of you, what are those ethical well, questions? There's right no now? doubt there's technological hurdles and there are ethical issues. But I do want to make sure that something isn't lost. I spoke to one of the authors. One of the big hopes for this is that for people who have devastating genetic diseases, for example, there's something called Huntington's disease, and that's a neurological condition. You get neurological degeneration and early death. Well, right now, if somebody has that gene, what the couple can elect to do is in vitro fertilization, they create embryos. They look at those embryos outside of the body, and they say, okay, there are a certain number that don't have the defect, and it would be 50%. There's a 50% chance. Well, the hope is with this technique that that could go up to a much higher percent, 72% in this study, but if it could go up to three quarters, something like that, you have a much better chance of having a successful pregnancy. And you don't have to discard all of those unused embryos. And they mentioned that this could help up to 10,000 different types of disorders, mm -hmm. all, certain types of Alzheimer's disease, certain types of breast and ovarian cancer, cystic fibrosis, taste sacs. Wow. So real potential for this type of... So encouraging of yeah. therapy. Next up, new developments in the government's fight against opioid abuse. This week, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the creation of the Opioid Fraud and Abuse Detection Unit. Also this week, the White House's newly created Commission on Com Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis released its interim report. The language in the report was direct, stating, our citizens are dying. We must act boldly to stop it. The opioid epidemic we are facing is unparalleled. John, when you look at the commission, it obviously has a huge problem it's facing, but what goals did it lay out? Well, I think the very first thing they did was they said, let's declare this a national emergency. So often when you look at where people go south with dealing with emergencies, they don't declare it an emergency. Once yeah. you say, okay, it's full speed ahead, all hands on deck, then you start doing the right stuff. So they said things like you need to increase access to treatment, and that means freeing up Medicaid funding. You need to have education for doctors about treating pain and also about treating addiction. So Tara and I just finished doing this mandatory New York State online prescription course for if you're prescribing narcotics. You need to have better access to medications like buprenorphine and methadone that can help people get off of this addictive cycle. And then in addition, you've heard about this antidote, naloxone. Uh, or Narcan is the is the is the generic is the brand name of it uh, that can help re reverse the effects of an overdose and they it can help save lives. They want to make that more available to policemen and other responders and also remove the possibility that you could get charged for criminal uh, you know charges for for reporting that you have an overdose or for helping somebody who's overdosed. So to try to try to make it so that it's just more commonly used and easily. Used. Tara, at the same time, uh, there's a new study that came out about opioids that patients may have left over after surgery. 
surgery. What did that study show? Right, so for many people, their initiation into the world of opioids comes at the time of a surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. And so while opioids are important in post-operative pain management, what happens to all of those opioids that are unused, unlocked, undiscarded? Well, they can become a reservoir for people in order for those to then go on to be used for non-medical purposes. And so that's what this uh, research really addressed. They, look at six, they looked at six studies, about 800 patients, seven different types of surgeries, and they found that about 70 to 90 percent of patients reported unused opioids. When they looked at the tablets that were given out, again, 40 to 70 percent of those remained unused. And then when they looked at where those opioids were stored, about 70 percent of people said they were in unlocked places, like cupboards or wardrobes or medicine cabinets. And even worse, when they looked at how or when people were discarding them, they found that about less than 30 percent really either planned to or did actually discard them in the proper way. All right, finally, time for our monthly segment on practical advice. Going to the drugstore and buying supplements like vitamin D pills or fish oils is pretty common. But should you keep your doctor informed if you're taking them? What should we know, doctors? Yes, you should. <laughs> yes. That's simple. That's you simple. Know, a lot of times doctors won't ask and patients won't tell, so it really remains unknown. And so I always make a point of asking patients, you know, okay, what medications do they take? And they tell me, and then I say, what supplements are you taking? What right. vitamins? I don't think and of a supplement as a medication. No. Right. right. But it can if, affect the, yes, the, the medication. Absolutely if, right. Think of the logic. If it's pharmacologically active and can help you, it's pharmacologically active and can hurt you. And I had a patient who we couldn't figure out why she had a high thyroid level, and I said, bring in all your medicines. Yeah. What's that one? Oh, Oh, I do that for weight loss. It had thyroid in it. Exactly. Yeah. Not well regulated. Yes, the answer is bring it all in. Brown bag it. Bring it in so we can see what it is. Right. Yeah, I always tell people they're not regulated by the FDA. You don't know what you're getting when you get these supplements. They can interact with other medications. and so They, they can decrease the effectiveness of important medicine, exactly. like cyclosporine. Exactly. So very important to discuss it with your doctor. Um, bring pictures, bring the bottles, show them what you're taking. Doctors John LaPoo, Tara Narula, thank you.